Here's where I've begun. The parabola is the easy bit. X squared, you know exactly what that looks like. The plus one, it's moved it up. <coughs> Happy times. Uh, let's point out two things before we get onto here. Oh, no, just one thing. Okay. Um, you should always label your axes. It's healthy to label your axes, right? This is the x-axis over here. Usually you would call the vertical one, you would usually call it the y-axis. Today I'm not going to call it the y-axis. Can anyone tell me why? Because I haven't written down a y anywhere on the board. There is no y, okay? We usually call it y, there's no problem with that. But I'm in function notation land, right? So instead I'm going to call this guy up here f of x. Okay, that's fine. Now just to give you a bit of a, uh, a tip, when you see questions and, and they're phrased in this way, um, sometimes they'll just, they'll just come out and say, um, let y equal f of x. And then they'll tell you what f of x is just like I have, right? In which case, if you want, you can label that thing y because y and f of x, they're exactly the same. That's, that's what that line means, okay? But in this case, I have no y's, so I'm gonna steer clear of them. Now, if that's the case, what is, what is this thing going to look like? Okay, now, um, we actually, I showed you before, but it was just kind of like, oh, a computer told me. But why is it that? We actually have enough tools to work out what this thing is going to look like. Part of it that's hard is that there's a plus or minus on there, right? What mathematicians classically do is if there's something that's difficult, you just consider something similar but easier and then see if you can take that understanding and grow it, okay? So let's just consider one part of it. Let's just consider this guy. The inverse. Okay. Now, remember, we've talked about like domain and range in the last two lessons, okay? And we've looked at functions like this. Can you help me work out what the domain and range of this function is? Okay, now let's think of domain first. Think of domain first. Um, what values can work in this thing versus what values can't? What kinds of things are going to break this? Because some things will break it, right? Yeah, what I want to avoid is negative numbers under this square root. If you got a negative under there, you kind of up the creek without a paddle, okay? So therefore, what I want is for that thing underneath the square root, which is x minus 1, I want it to be not negative. Now, not negative sounds like positive, doesn't it? It's almost, I'm missing one number. What number I'm missing off there? Zero. Zero, Zero is fine. Zero is not negative. So I'm going to include it. Alright, so x minus 1 is greater than or equal to 0. You could solve that. That's really easy to solve. What do I do? I just add 1 to both sides, don't I? So I'll get x is greater than or equal to 1. There's my domain, okay? So that's where I can go horizontally. Let's think about the range now. Okay, the range. Now, this is a square root, this is a square root. No matter what numbers you put into this thing, right? Like, okay, you can try one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's all you can put in. Do you see, you're always going to get something that's zero or higher. Do you see that, right? Like when I put in x equals one, that's, that's the edge of my domain. I get the square root of one minus one, which is zero. Um, when I put in x equals like five, Right? I'm going to get the square root of 5 take away 1, which is the square root of 4, so that'll be 2. I'm getting bigger, aren't I? I'm never getting smaller. Okay? So therefore, the conclusion I draw is the range is that I have to be greater than or equal to 0. Okay? All right, now I know where I can go. Domain is 1 and on. Range is 0 and up. Okay? What's it going to look like? If you test some values, you will get this kind of shape. Okay, um, all I need to do is plot some points to verify that. And I actually, we just did a few of them. I said x equals 1, y will equal 0, x equals 4, y will equal 2, and on, 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 on. Sorry, x equals 1. Okay. Now, I said we would take this and we would simplify it. Done. I'm missing half, aren't I? I'm missing this part. This is the minus part of the plus or minus, right? So I've done the positive, now I'm going to do the negative. Let's think in terms of domain and range again. What's the difference between the domain of this guy and the domain of this guy? Domain. Domain. Hmm. 
Now, it's a bit sneaky, this one. It's, it's a deliberate curveball. Why did I work out up here that x minus 1 has to be greater than or equal to 0? Why, why did you tell me that? Because a negative will destroy the whole thing. A negative, importantly, a negative under the square root will destroy the whole thing. That's what will cause you trouble. Okay? Now, what's underneath the square root here? It's, it's exactly the same thing, isn't it? x minus 1, x minus 1. So the domain of this function and this function are identical. They're not different. They still have the same thing under the square root. So the same thing is going to destroy both of them, right? So I can still say x minus 1 is going to be greater than or equal to 0. So therefore, x is going to be greater than or equal to 1. Domain is the same. But now when you have a look at range, range is different, right? Test some values and it's very easy to see, right? We'll start at x equals 1, because that's in the domain. When x equals 1, what's this thing going to be equal to? What's f of the inverse of 1? You'll just get 0 here, won't you? But as you start to put in more numbers, right? Like, let's put in 5. Let's, let's do this. Let's do this. f of the inverse of 5. I am dutifully going to replace all of my x's with 5s, right? So I'll just go to the next slide. Minus square root of. 5 take away 1. That's minus the square root of 4. That's negative 2, right? And in fact, the more x's you put in, the bigger those x's get, the more negative y is going to get. It's going to keep dropping, right? So in fact, the range of this guy is the opposite of the range of this guy. It's the other way. Less than or equal to 0. Okay, it's going down. On that basis, and if I wanted to, I would try out some values. I know that the other part's going to look like this. It's just that graph upside down. Okay? In the same way that if I gave you x squared, you knew what it looked like. And if you slap a minus sign on it, it goes upside down. Okay? Same thing. Okay, now, now that we can see it, now this part is obvious, right? Do you remember in the very first lesson I said, how do you know if something's a function or not? Okay? You either say, how many inputs, how many outputs do I have? or you get a vertical line, right? And you put it on any way you like, okay? If your vertical line hits more than once, that means you've got more than one output, right? And I'm busted, okay? Pretty quickly I'm busted, okay? So that's why this guy is not a function, no inverse function. Now I could have known that, I could have known I wouldn't have got a function right from the beginning, right? You remember we did this really quick exercise. I asked you to rotate your heads. Do you remember that? I said, turn your heads 45 degrees this way. I'm going to put the line in and I want you to do the same. The line I want you to put in is y equals x. It looks like this. Pass us through the origin. And it goes off at a 45 degree angle like so. Okay. This f inverse... This is the reflection of the original function across y equals x, right? That's how I get this thing, okay? Um, because it's the reflection, it's the same as actually taking it and rotating it around 90 degrees through a right angle. Do you see that? Okay. So therefore, if this passes, sorry, if this fails, this vertical line test, right? What would it look like on the original function? What happens when you take a vertical line and you rotate it 90 degrees? You don't get a vertical line, you get a, or here's a vertical line, and you rotate it and you get a horizontal line, right? So before I did any of this algebra business, I could have looked at the original graph and said, hey, if I put a horizontal line across there, it fails. I have two inputs, right? So therefore, once I rotate it, of course I'm going to get two outputs, okay? So, here's my conclusion off of making that statement, right? If a, um, if a graph passes the vertical line test, right? We know it's a function. That's fine, okay? If it fails, it's not going to be a function, like a circle or something like that, okay? But if I want to get an inverse, if I want to get an inverse, I don't want a vertical line to go through it. 
I want a horizontal line to go through it, right? So it, this is what happens from the vertical line test. If a graph passes the horizontal line test, then it's not that it's a function necessarily, but it will have an inverse function. Now, if we go back to our very, very first example, which was just a straight line, right? Uh, whatever it was, y equals 3x plus 1 or something like that, okay? Oh, I just dropped it off. There we go. Um, y, f of x equals 3x plus 1. Can you see this passes the vertical line test? So it's a function. Here it is. There. You can put any vertical line through there you like. So, tick, it's a function, right? But not only can I put a vertical line through it, I can also put in any horizontal line I like. Okay? Therefore, it also does this. It has an inverse function. It's going to be fine. Right? And that's why we, we worked it out and you get this equation. Okay? It's that same thing, by the way. If you take y equals x by green dotted line, you can place it through again. And again, when you rotate your head, you can see the reflection coming across. Do you see that? 